First, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Nina Lansot and Carlos Spina. I've known both of them for quite a long time, and they both share my passion, uh, I think, for punching shear. Now, you're very familiar with the ACI way of dealing with punching shear, and it's really no different in footings. But it, uh, it's always good to remember that this was never intended to be a way of predicting test results. This was always intended to be a design procedure, and it means that you've already dealt with punching. So I, I think that's an important thing to put up front, because we usually beat up the ACI code quite a bit, and it's not really fair. Um, if you go back to the original Mo, Mo test work, uh, he had an analytical method that did account for reinforcement and did account for a bunch of other stuff, and that was deemed unnecessary for design, because in design you can always presume the flexural reinforcement will be provided. So it wasn't necessary to count it twice. And so that's how we got to this very simple model. The model doesn't tell you what's going on inside at all. Um, and, and it raises questions about size effect and span to depth ratio and do we get a benefit from the high contact pressure. So what Carlos wanted to do, this is not the paper I was going to write for this, this group. Carlos insisted we look at footings and, and, uh, and see what the strip model uh, might, might add to our view of footings. So in the strip model, we've got um, um, an internal load path being described. So we can imagine the load coming down from the column. And uh, the first thing that happens is it gets spread out. I don't know if I've got any indicator here. I've got this. I've got one of these. It gets spread out. Uh, you'll see how the, the pleasures of getting older. I now jigger, jiggle quite a bit. But anyway, the first thing that happens is the load comes in and it is carried by a curved arch uh, and distributed into what I call arch strips on, on either side. These are really deep beams, short little deep beams that act as load spreaders. And then perpendicular to those beams, we have more I'll say more slender, but slender is in quotation marks. Uh, it's just more slender compared to, to this arching action. More slender behavior, flexural behavior spreading the load out. And it turns out that this model really maps well onto what we measure for strain. Uh, in, in, in suspended slabs, we can actually track the strain gauges, the internal loads, using, using strain gauges placed in accordance with how this says the load should be distributed, and it, and it works uh, very nicely. You get uh, internal strain measurements uh, mapping well onto what you actually measure for the load. So it's not based on a failure condition. This is sort of a strut and tie for two-way slab. This, this strip model only works for two-way slabs because it needs different kinds of behavior. It needs deep mean behavior in one direction and comparatively slender mean behavior perpendicular. So it needs flexural behavior in two different directions that are different. Um, it is compatible, though, with conventional strut and tie, which is the reason why it is applicable, I think, to the footings. So here we've got the footing. Our notion is that load comes in, and there is a certain amount of load. We can imagine there's just the, in the shadow of the column, it's just going to come straight down like a, uh, a very direct strut. We can also have other struts. So you, can, you can sort of imagine doing a strut and tie model, and you can map out the whole thing. And what we're saying is, well, you could model all the load this way, but we're saying uh, you only have to model part of the load this way because some more load could come in this other mechanism. The two mechanisms can coexist quite happily. Now, both mechanisms, though, are, are, they're going to share the load, and so we, we can say that we've got a, a, a conventional strut and tie. I'm just going to call that P direct. A strip model mechanism is going to be P strip, very original uh, topics. What really matters, though, is both of them need moment in here. They both make demands on the moment at that phase. I use moment as a sort of a stand-in. Their, their compression block has to go in there. The tension can be spread out quite a bit wider, but the compression block of that, that flexural compression block has to be there because whether it's uh, 
a strip model strut or a conventional strut and tie, it's the vertical component of that compression that's carrying the load. So all of the load in one quadrant of this, or one quarter of this, this specimen, has got to go in uh, one of these faces. So, real simple statics. If you want the fraction that goes from uh, uh, P direct, it's just whatever fraction of that moment capacity you've got there divided by E. Strip model is a little more complicated. It, it's, it actually gets more efficient for load applied farther away from the column. Um, uh, and uh, the, high, the whole idea of this, consistent with any kind of, uh, I would say, load path type method of design is uh, we, we should have our, our best answer, our most accurate answer when we maximize the sum of these two. So we're looking for the combination, the distribution of this finite resource, which is the moment at the face, stop jiggling, the moment at the face, that's a finite resource. It can do some direct strut and tie or it can do some strip. It, it can't do more than its sum. The sum of those two is, always, is, is limited. It can't, can't, exceed, can't exceed what you've got. This is, turns out to be an important thing. We know from observation that the compression strut comes in quite steeply uh, in, in a footing. And that has a profound effect about on the way we calculate moment. Uh, moment capacity, we have a tensile force and lots of steel. So the tension is not, not a problem. But this compression, um, if it's a strut coming in at a steep angle, the depth of the compression block or rather the horizontal component of this, this, com this compression force, which will equal the tension ultimately, um, uh, it is um, quite a bit wider than the actual depth of the compression strut. And it gets more extreme the steeper the strut goes. And, the, and it boils down to one way of looking at it is we can say there's an effective strength of the concrete that's modified by cos squared of that angle, whatever that angle of the compression is. So if it's 45 degrees, uh, that, which is what we're going to assume, that's a 0.5 factor. This doesn't matter at all if it's lightly reinforced and, and, and the compression block is small. But that's almost never the case in the test data. The test data have very generous amounts of reinforcement. Many of them are over-reinforced because they wanted to study shear failures. So, I'm going to say method one here, method one plus. Uh, so, method one is just these first bits. M face over E, that's the part that's direct strut and pi. Uh, e times Q sub C is actually the additional kick you are getting from a uh, strip model mechanism. The fact that you don't see the moment capacity showing up here is a bit of mathematical magic that I was quite surprised to find. But that is what comes out if you want to maximize this system. Um, and then finally, uh, the strip model says it's better if, if you can account for the actual contact pressure, you get a benefit from that. But it really messes up the calculations because I don't start off knowing what the contact pressure is going to be. Uh, so did it iteratively and then found that with back calculation, you can approximate the iteration really well. This is about within about 2% uh, with, with this expression. And so you could actually account for the uh, direct load cor correction factor in here. Hence, I, I have a method 1 plus. Method 1 would be uh, without that load correction. So what do we get? Um, oh, I, the reason method 1 is because there's a second method, method 2. Um, and the method, method one and method two differ only in the way they account for plate coercion. And so method one uses a slightly wider band of reinforcement to account for the enhancing effect of plate torsion. And method two tries to actually assess what the torsional loads are on the side face of one of those arch strips. Um, and uh, the results are actually quite comparable. I thought that method one was Slightly better, but only slightly. So what do we see here? Well, 
First of all, the code is really good on these tests. 112 tests, footings with realistic loading. So this is either reacting against sand uh, or it's being loaded against springs, but they are just good modeling of distributed load. So it's not uh, just a thick two-way slab test. Um, and so we can see code, code, you know, a coefficient of variation of 15.8% in shear related stuff. Uh, why are we even spending any time on it? I mean, this is already very good. Um, but I will say that uh, method one, uh, things to note. First of all, they are conservative, and, and method one is already tighter than ACI on the same uh, data set. And if you include the beneficial effect of, of the load, uh, it tightens even more. So these, these two, while it's not proof, uh, they are certainly indicative that maybe tracking a load path through a structure is a very useful way of under, understanding tests. That's number one. Um, and uh, perhaps identifying things in the future we might want to, to examine more fully. So here's what the test results look like. Uh, you've seen the statistics. Uh, we've got uh, only a few test specimens with these huge uh, uh, soil pressures. We're plotting, plotting the test pressure against the, the pressure predicted. And you can see the, the, the circles are all ACI. The, the, the pluses are all method one plus. I think I've got another, because there's a lot of data in that cloud so here's a detail of the data in the cloud. And you know, they're, they're both performing quite well. I think you can generally see that uh, the ACI has a larger scatter everywhere. And just about everywhere, the, the strip model approach is just pulling the data together a little bit on the safe side. It, it, it has a bias to the safe side. Here's what we see for an influence of size. Um, and, and, and while it's, it's proportion to, it looks very dramatic, I, I look at this and I don't see a lot of size effect. And I realize that, that if you want to see it, you can see that downward trend very easily. But I also observe that uh, just about all of these tests in here are from one source. And just about all the tests up here are from one source. And if you've been around, there, there are, I, I think there are six sources for all this data. If you've been around the, the, the testing world for a while, you realize that there are biases in, in test labs and things like that. So there's, it, it would be nice to get just more data to see if this really is uh, a trend or if this is just an artifact of idiosyncrasies about the way, the way things are, are tested. Uh, certainly the, uh, the results for method one plus, the, the scatter is down quite a bit. Uh, I would be very, ha I I would be very happy if, if this trend just went off flat. I don't find any of this to be um, much evidence of any kind of, of size effect. But certainly not very compelling. This is one of the things we get off this analysis, though, is a measure of load sharing. So remember, I set it up so that the load from the two mechanisms is maximum. If you don't follow this distribution, if you choose some other measure, you, let's say on a, on a test specimen, uh, the optimum was 40% by direct strutting, 60% by strip model. Let's say you don't go with that. You are going to get a safe prediction of load. All the other predictions are lower loads that are predicted, not higher. This is one of the benefits of tracking the load path and, and scaling it up with, or, or scaling it to defensible capacities, I'll put it that way. So instead of looking at what are the conditions of failure, we are looking here at what are the conditions of success? And, and so maximum success is following this. And then this actually turns out to be, it doesn't look at it here, it's actually analytical. 
Uh, but it's not just A over D that matters. It turns out that the whatever the design capacity for the moment of the face of the column on the M face, that actually shows up. So it's not just A over D, although A over D is a big deal. Uh, moment capacity also fits in, and we see that because of the mechanics of the model. And so that will give us things that we can test in the future. I haven't tested them yet. Uh, Carlos just came up with the idea for the paper in the first, just, just recently. So, what can I say? Uh, combination. This is really a combination of strut and tie with, with an arch strip. So those two things are going at the same time. Uh, we have reasonable agreement with TESS. Uh, I expect there shall be less size effect in footings compared to slabs. Uh, just based on the fact that a large fraction of the load is going uh, to the image geometry, it goes to direct start and tie. There is, I would predict, a small size effect with uh, the strip model style of carrying the load. And I've accounted for that. But um, I, I would expect we, we should generally see less. Uh, direct struts dominate when A over D is less, less than about one and a half. That's maybe not a big surprise. Uh, the results are very sensitive to M face, and we have a preponderance of data that are effectively over reinforced. They are governed probably by crushing of the concrete to decide um, how much moment you can carry. And the, the rough estimates of whether the steel is reaching yield, whether the concrete is crushing. Where that is reported by, by researchers, the method is reasonably in agreement. Very rare that it's all reported. So it's, it's hard to make that a, you know, a blanket statement. Um, but it does explain the relative insensitivity of, of these tests to Rho. Hence, that's why the ACI standard, the ACI code is looking so good. Uh, they are insensitive to, to row because they've got excess reinforcement for the most part. If you've got twice as much of, of reinforcement as you need, then bumping it up to three times as much really doesn't do anything. You don't get any benefit from that. And if you've got twice as much, knocking it down to one and a half times as much also doesn't have a big, big effect. And that is that.